Hello and welcome to the second live story walk. Story walk live, there's no viewers yet. Obviously they will be on YouTube when you're watching the cash out of this, so just talking to you now in the future, people that are watching this in the future, whilst we wait for people to join the live broadcast. And um, last week I did a walk uh, through the sort of mythology of Islington and Pentonville really, Pentonville, Finsbury up to Barnsbury. And this is the continuation. This is going to be a slightly different experience, actually, and um, highlights a different use of using a street view for walking around London. Naturally, I'd obviously prefer to be out walking in real life. Hello, and welcome to this broadcast, the viewer that's just joined. We're going to be taking a wander, wander through um, a different part of mythology of uh, London today, uh, over in West London where we're going to climb Horsington Hill. Well, we're not really going to climb it, actually, because Street View won't take you over the top of Horsington Hill. It sort of takes you around it, but it will do for the, the sake of this, and it will give me the chance to talk about the legend of Horsington Hill. You might think it's a bit unpromising where we are at the moment, so we're going to start moving along very shortly. Um, this walk in the book uh, is, chapter, is in Chapter 5, and it's called The Lost Elysium. And it's so named because, uh, A, it's a line from a poem by John Betjeman. And it's also um, was the title of a pictorial essay in um, a copy of the uh, London and Middlesex Archaeological Journal. And it was a, a series of photographs of old Middlesex that showed rural Middlesex at the turn of the 20th century, well actually not just the turn of the 20th century really, from the sort of the first 35, 36 years of the 20th century, and it showed a really kind of rural landscape around Hanger Lane, Ealing, Perryvale, Greenford, Sudbury. And so the walk that I did, I wanted to try and find the lost Elysium of Middlesex, expecting really it not to be there anymore, and so I set off from Sudbury Hill uh, across the top of Horsington Hill, and uh, and then down through Perryvale to Hanwell on the edge of Ealing at the Warncliffe Viaduct. And we can only do a portion of that walk uh, on Street View because a lot of it goes across parks and across hills. So here we are going along Horsington Lane North. This is quite early on in the walk. I did it on Remembrance Sunday last year, 2012. And uh, Horsington Hill is one of the highest points in West London. It's uh, 85 metres high, so that's 276 feet above sea level. And it is um, an ancient hill fort, uh, would you believe. Uh, this human habitation on Horsenden Hill stretching back around 7,000 years. And Horses Hill is said to mean horses done. The hill of Horsa, Horsa being a Saxon warrior supposedly buried in the mount of Horsington Hill upon the summit, but uh, as yet his remains have not been found. Now here's the ballot box pub. Now this area here, in my old 1950s Geographia Atlas, which is what I use when I go walking, I don't use the modern A to Z, I use um, an old 1950s one and they're really beautiful. You can get one on eBay fairly cheaply if you're lucky. Uh, the 1930s ones, which were even more beautiful, do cost a pretty penny, but I think mine cost about £3.50. I highly recommend getting one of these if you like walking around London because they're really beautiful objects. We're being really sold short with our A to Zs now. If you compare the two, uh, when I do talks in bookshops, I always take it along and show it to people, and there's always that lovely gasp when they see the, uh, when they see the book. Um, now, this area was called Brabston Green, and um, which is, I always think, sounds like something from Trumpton. If you're not from the UK, you might want to look up Trumpton on YouTube <laughs> to see what. I'm, or actually, if you're under the age of 40, you probably won't get that reference either. But um, the, this pub is all that remains of the village. The rest of the buildings were knocked down after the war. So that's an, uh, the opposite of what usually happens in London, where villages get built up and built around. Here, they actually just erase the village, and all that's left of the lost village of Brabston is this pub called the Ballot Box. And the reason I think it's called the ballot box is that it's where um, people that worked in the canal, which we'll see later, which is on the other side of Horsenden Hill, it's where the uh, the barge workers would come to vote. This was there where they had their ballot box. So we'll work our way up Horsenden Lane North, which is where I came on the walk. And 
when I went to go up Horsenden Hill, I turned off, I think, just here. You'll see there's a footpath here that leads into a really beautiful meadow. And from there, you can ascend through the woods up to the top of Horsenden Hill to the 276 feet across sea level. And the, the views are amazing. You can see at least, I'd say, four counties. You can look out to the Chilterns, to Buckinghamshire. You can see out to um, Hemel Hempstead and Watford in Hertfordshire. You can see um, out to Runnymede. You can see Surrey, um, the North Downs. So you've got views of Surrey, Kent, Buckinghamshire and Hertfordshire. I reckon on a clear day with a pair of binoculars, you might just be able to see um, Essex, possibly. Uh, if you could look across the towers of the City of London. What's amazing about it is, is because it is such an ancient site, an ancient hill fort, when you stand upon the summit of this site that goes back at least 7,000 years, you kind of get a glimpse of London that you don't see at Street View. You know, it's a uh, Street View. We're using Google Street View. It's street level. Because the buildings at that height, the buildings become just little, little brown smudges. And what you see is the landscape. You see the shape of London. And so it gives you that view. You feel like it's almost a kind of act of time travel, which is very apt because later on we will be seeing some sites that featured in a whole series of uh, Doctor Who. It's got a strong attachment to uh, to Horsenden Hill. Now, one of the most beguiling things about Horsenden Hill isn't the trig point on the summit. There is a trig point. Trig points, um, I didn't know this actually before I started writing the book, so I shan't assume that you do. They're the... Um, Maps are made by um, creating triangles, I believe. So, so, they, so they plot out these triangles, and then that's how they get the coordinates for maps. And so around London, you do see these stone obelisks that are used in the triangulation of cartography. And there is a trig point on the top of Horsenden Hill. It looks like some sort of ancient monument on this ancient hill fort, but actually it's relatively modern. So we're moving along the side of Horsenden Hill. Now the story of Horsenden Hill, Horses Done, is uh, recounted in a, a wonderful book called The Chronicles of Greenford Parva, published in 1890 by John Allen Brown. And the story goes that Horser was a Saxon warrior who ruled this part of Middlesex. Or it wouldn't have been called Middlesex then, would it? Uh, and he was married to this, um, this beautiful woman who was gifted with supernatural powers. This really is sort of like Hobbit territory, isn't it? Lord of the Rings. And they have one daughter called Eline. You can see where we're heading with this, can't you? Um, and she, um, she was so beautiful and so intelligent, she became famous throughout the region for her, for her beauty and intelligence. Kind of like a kind of, you know, a Saxon Carol Vorderman, maybe, I don't know. And uh, she wouldn't marry anybody. She kept rejecting the advances of all the suitors who came to ask for her hand in marriage. And eventually, for some reason, she married this bloke who was called Bren, who was the chief of a neighbouring tribe from across the river. Now, Bren, I mean, he wasn't really a good match. He was quite, he was quite basic and oafish chap. But they got married, and according to the rites of Odin, the Saxon deity, and there was a festival for many days. It was a big celebration. And Bren carried his beauteous prize off to his castle, and which at this stage feels like a wonderful fairy tale. But it wasn't long before Bren lapsed into his old ways, which is very delicately dealt with in the Chronicles of Greenford Parva. But let's just say it looks like he was fooling around with the local wenches. And, uh, and he wasn't exactly bookish, whereas Eli was in her little tower with her books, reading away. So she got a bit peeved by this. And uh, being that she was the daughter of a woman with supernatural powers in the Saxon era, she obviously had a pet talking bird. So she um, told the bird all about this and sent the bird off to t m tell her dad, Horsa, the Saxon warrior who lived on Horsenden Hill. Well, he didn't, actually, he may not have lived on Horsenden Hill, actually, uh, but he lived in the region of Horsenden Hill. And so he reacted the way that any self-respecting Saxon chieftain would react if you found out your daughter was being... Um, cheated on by her husband and so he raised an army to go and fight Bren and win back his daughter's honour. Now Bren heard about this and Horsa set off with his army from Horsington Hill, from the, this lane and these fields where we're going through now. The great army marched from here and they met Bren's army who crossed the, the river Thames 
um, at the point uh, bend and where it meets the, the River Brent, its confluence with the Brent, and there the two armies met, and there was a dreadful battle. Bren was killed at that point, and ever since, the area has borne his name, so they say, hence Brent Foot. He's named after Bren and the point where he died. Um, Horsa was mortally wounded and was carried back and buried upon the top of the hill. Now, there's the part of the story I like, I mean, that is quite a good story. It's just a load of Saxons knocking lumps out of each other and supernatural talking bird and all the rest of it. But locals, apparently, even in the 1890s, they would avoid this spot here. No one would have come down here after dark. They avoided the region of Horsenden Hill at night time because they um, they believed that at night time horses war horse walked the fields around the bottom of Washington Hill and one morning they found a series of blue hoof prints scorched into the fields into a hoar frost which they took as being the hoof prints of horses horse horses horse it's a bit of alliteration um, and they were convinced by that which is wonderful. Now, another version of that story actually does occur in Doctor Who. Um, in Doctor Who, the, in 1989, it, Sylvester McCoy's Doctor Who comes down to Perryvale. Here you can see here, we're just entering Perryvale. And his sidekick was a, uh, called Ace. Also, it was, I should choose my words carefully here, but Doctor Who, why is he like an older bloke with a younger female attractive sidekick? You know, so I think someone who would have thought that would have been addressed at some point in the last 50 odd years. Anyway, in 1989, his psychic was someone called Ace, and she was from Perryvale, and she thought Perryvale was boring, so she jumped to the chance of jumping into TARDIS and heading off around uh, the universe. And they, but they kept coming back to to Perryvale, and lots of that series, which would have been the final series of Doctor Who, because it ended uh, for a number of years in 1989. There was a big break in Doctor Who, so that actually. Doctor Who could have ended in Perryvale. And so they kept coming back to Perryvale, and in one episode, they come back, and Ace notices that all of her friends have gone missing, and she can't find any of them. And she goes to the playground where her, they used to hang out around the roundabout and the swings, and um, in, per in Perryvale, supposedly boring Perryvale. And she, um, instead of her friends, there were just lots of cats. And it turns out the cats were sort of like they were these shape-shifting bipedal cheetahs that's all I can describe them as they were coming from another dimension and basically these cats were what they sort of hid as in our world and then suddenly they would transform into these kind of cheetah people two-legged cheetah people would ride horses and they were abducting her friends and taking them back to this other dimension so um, they were trying to uh, unravel this conundrum of what had happened to Ace's friends and so they went up to Horsenden Hill, the top of Horsenden Hill, back here, where Ace used to hang out with her friends. There you go, you can sort of see it in the top of these trees here. That's where. And so Sylvester McCoy, Doctor Who, and Ace went up there looking for her friends. But what they found was just a series of mysterious hoof prints, eh? which I see as a clear reference to the legend of Horsenden Hill. Um, now the reason I've stopped here is to show that this is this is the canal that cuts through. This is the Grand Union Canal, and it, it goes from Paddington Basin. It goes through Slough, come friendly bombs, fall on Slough. I was just talking to Lana here about this actually, who works at HarperCollins, about the wonders of Slough. Got a job in your hand, Slough, haven't you? If the poet laureate has really taken a pop at you, it's hard to recover from that. I think Slough's basically all right, but anyway, this canal goes through Slough, and it heads up to Birmingham ultimately. Now when I walked across here on the day I thought this is vaguely familiar, I think I've been here before and um, I wasn't sure and then I had a, I had a memory because I've never walked over Horsenden Hill before and I had a memory that actually I'd done some filming along here and I filmed the writer Will Self walking with my friend the writer Nick Papadimitra. I filmed that in I think 2008 and they walked along the towpath here and Will Self was walking from London to Hollywood, and it's recounted in his book, Walking to Hollywood, a book that I highly recommend, as well as my own, of course, this other London, Adventures in the Overlook City, available from all good independent bookstores. Uh, and Waterstones, I'm doing a signing at Waterstones in Piccadilly as well, actually, on the 5th of December. So, 
<laughs> Just give them a plug as well. Who else do I need to appease? Um, so I filmed Will and Nick walking along here, actually, and uh, I was basically mostly concentrating not falling in the canal at the time. I and mean, I checked Will's book to see if it was recounted in there. It is recounted in there. He talks about being filmed. It's, it's an uh, unusual book, but it's highly, uh, so highly recommended. And uh, this is the bit in Will's book about um, being filmed along here in Walking to Hollywood. Basically, all the people in the book are played by actors. So I'm not me. I'm Ron Howard. Uh, no, I, you have to read the book to get how that works. Nobody, I think he's David Lewis. Uh, so it says, the wrong John character, that's me, is a bat-eared sycophant in a letter jersey making up to Henry Winkler. That was me. But the thing that intrigued me most was, in the book, I apparently show the camera to Will Self, the Will Self character, who then takes the tape out and throws it in the canal, which didn't actually happen. But he says, I simply removed the tape cassette and chucked it in the canal. He trudged away disconsonant, disconsonately over Horsenden Hill, which is interesting because I'd never been over Horsenden Hill at that point. So a fictional version of me had walked over Horsenden Hill before... The actual me had walked over Horsenden Hill, which for me is completely in keeping with this area where Doctor Who hangs out. There are bipedal cheetah people. There are, you know, there's the magic of Eline and the, Sax the wife of the Saxon warrior Bren. Now, what happened later on in life, after this terrible battle when Horsa was killed and buried in the summit of the hill, Eline and her daughter... Re retired into the, uh, the groves around the foot of the hill, this area around here. This is where, and they practiced their magic, and they healed the local people, and they became beloved of all the local people in the area. When they both died, Eline was buried in a place which still bears her name. It was called Eline's Haven. Now, if you've ever caught a bus to Ealing, Broadway, you get off the bus at a place called Ealing Haven, and underneath one of those bus stops somewhere is the body of a fairy princess may not seem that romantic when you're there at the time, but it is indeed. This is the playground that features in Doctor Who um, with Ace. This is where Ace's friends used to hang out, and they'd come here, and they it's full of cats, and her friends have gone, and they've all been uh, taken away. Now, I'm going to take a bit of a risk here. Oh, I've got questions. Sorry. I, 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 there's some really good questions here. Hang on a moment. Do you generally listen to music or audiobooks while walking, or are you happy to walk in silence? I don't listen to no, I don't listen to any music actually. Um, I just um, I listen to the voices in my head. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. Did the so did the beautiful A to Z inspire you to start walking, or were you? I was already a wanderer actually, and the old maps are just a way of finding a route into it. So. Um, uh, I use old walking guides and old maps, and when you form a sort of different impression of places when you're looking at these old maps and old walking guides to what you might think when you look, walk down an environment like this, you know, and you've got a mixture of this is relatively old housing up here, you've got some relatively new housing, and then you look at the old maps, you look at old photographs, and it helps you gain a, a completely different view of it, really. Um, was that due to bombing? Was that Brabston Green? No, I don't think it was. I don't think they did knock it down due to bombing. I think it became depopulated for some reason. I'm not entirely sure why. I should uh, I should look that up, shouldn't I? James Lewis, never mind Bath. We need a tour of Watford. John, also, what about your favourite songs about London? Favourite songs about London, that's a really good question. I've done a playlist, actually, a Spotify playlist of favourite songs about London. Hopefully that will be sticking it out soon. So there are, there are so many. What's one of them? Uh, White Riot by The Clash. Um, I've related that to the um, to the Battle of Lewisham in 1977. Also, uh, obviously, l l you can't get past London Calling. Park Life by Blur, a celebration of London dog tracks, is a great song. Plasto Patricia by Ian Dury. It's a great song about London. Uh, it's very rude, so if you're going to listen to it and you're offended by the lyrics, don't blame me. Blame Ian Dury. He's dead, actually, so he won't mind. Uh, there are a number of others. Bath. People get going on about Bath. Okay. I've, I've been to Bath once. It's very nice. It's very hilly. More about Kent, please. Big up in the Medway. And the Medway is a terrific region, isn't it? My sister lives in Maidstone, and we did a project there a few years ago called Reframing Maidstone. Um, I do go... In the book, I go to Erith and um, the Dartford salt marshes, 
and Slade Green, Halbury Moat, those kind of places. Inaccessible on Street View, unfortunately, otherwise we'd go there. Um, and yeah, Kent is a marvellous county. Um, I used to live in Perryvale on my own turf, Chris. Right? I keep bumping into people when I talk about Perryvale. I keep bumping into people who have got a link to Perryvale. And I found it a magical place. What I should have said as well is because of the association with uh, Horse's wife and their daughter, Eline, uh, that is one of the supposed origins of um, Perryvale, is that it's the pure veil. Then there are a number of other... Uh, ideas about where it gets its name from, but I, I think I'd stick with that one, Perry Vale, the pure veil. Um, hi John, could you do a story walk in Bath? Eric Wimpole. <laughs> Hello Eric, yes I'd love to do a story walk in Bath, it would be marvellous. It's a very hilly Bath, beautiful place. I'd quite like to do a live story walk in Bath, though. I'd like to do it whilst I'm walking around in Bath. And oh, there's another question before we move on. The word fugue, excellent, which is part of your Twitter handle. That's right, it means running away from home in French. Do you walk to find things or do you walk to get away from them? Marine, that is a bloody good question. Um, both, I think. Uh, um, when you come home from a fugue, a uh, home looks completely different to what it did when you left. Um, so one of the most enlightening things for me is to reapproach a familiar place from an unfamiliar angle and uh, you can step outside your front door you can walk for a few hours and you completely change how you see the world around you and that's one of the reasons I wrote the book is that you know in my 20s actually I did kind of run away and I went backpacking and I went to Thailand and I ended up in Borneo and Sumatra and I climbed volcanoes and I went and slept in a wooden hut with headhunters and did all that kind of stuff and I lived in Australia for years on Bondi Beach and went to India and did all those things um, and actually my world view is probably more informed by taking a walk out of my front door down to the Thames across the Thames on the Woolwich Ferry, then over the top of Abbey Woods to Erith. You know, that made me see the world around me in a completely different way, more so than visiting the temple complex of Bora Badur, for example. So, uh, good question. Uh, right, okay, now we're going to go to uh, northwest London. And we're going to go to... Crickerwood Lane North. And there's so many things to say about Crickerwood Lane. This is um chapter. This is the following chapter, and it it relates to this chapter in the sense that my good friend Nick Papadimitrio, he owns the domain name for MiddlesexCountyCouncil.org, which is quite strange. He gets lots of requests for people to ask if they can put their kebab fans um, in various places. And so when I did the walk. Um, through Crickerwood, sorry, through um, Horsenden Hill, I felt a bit guilty actually. So I thought, well, Nick sort of feels like he owns Middlesex, <laughs> that it's his. And uh, here I was walking on it and, and writing about it. So I had to do a walk with Nick. So it took a while to get in touch with him. He sort of disappears. He lives in the tower block in Child's Hill, and he sometimes is difficult to reach. So I had to send him a postcard. And uh, he said, okay, we'll do a walk, and we'll walk to Uxenden Hill. Now, Uxenden Hill is marginally higher than Horsenden Hill, I think, by about three or four feet. And it sits above Wembley Stadium. And we walked out here on the longest, uh, actually, nearly exactly a year ago. It was the 22nd of December 2012, which some of you will be aware was the time that a lot of people thought would be the end of the world. They thought that was the, the Mayan long calendar prophesied that would be the end of the world. Obviously, they weren't taking into account that the Mayans just had another calendar that carried on, which is the end of one calendar and the start of another, not the end of time itself. <laughs> so we walked out there. We thought, well, you know, if it's going to be the end of the world, you want a good view. And we thought that would be a good place to watch the end of the world from. And so Crickwood Lane was, uh, was on the route that we took. Um, Marines asked another great question. Thanks for that. Puts a different twist than typical gap years. That's right, gap years. <laughs> That's a funny video, isn't it, gap year? Yeah. Well, you know, I highly recommend it. I mean, the thing is, people say you can't run away. You bloody can. Uh, <laughs> and I had a great time running away. You know, I was away for th uh, three years, and it was fantastic. But it's not very practical in a, a long-term 
sense and I think it, part of your daily life you don't need to actually you know adventure is just a step away just a left turn away just change your route to work get off the tube four stops early and take the first left the second right the first left and keep repeating that for a half an hour and trust me you know you'll have an experience well you'll be late for work possibly um, so we're moving along Crickwood Lane and there's so many gods there's so much this basically um, it's difficult to think it now. Look at it. This is a. We're really being let down by our architecture, aren't we? Look, look at this nonsense. I mean, I don't want to sound like Prince Charles, but not a lot of thoughts gone into that. It might be a really nice place to work inside. But this was once the heart of Britain's aircraft industry. And uh, I know I talked last week a little bit about the flights from Hounslow Heath. And again, I find myself in an area which had actually this was the first aerodrome, Crickwood Aerodrome. There was a the Handley Page Aircraft Factory was down here, where they built aircraft, and it was just over. Now I'm not sure if it was that building here or the, the, the site of this building up here. The, the aerodrome was over here somewhere, I believe. But it didn't have customs facilities; it didn't have room for it. That's why they did those flights from uh, Hounslow Heath initially, and. Um, so this was a big aircraft factory over here and the aerodrome here unfortunately when they did start flying passengers from it it had the unwanted distinction it was the site of the first passenger air crash in Britain uh, which is an unfortunate distinction they should have let Hounslow have that shouldn't they now this Virgin Active Gym I think was the place where the Handley Page aircraft factory was and it then became a place called the Production Village in 1979 I think it got knocked down they built a uh, a film studio here that was where the Hellraiser films were made and I think they also made a lot of dodgy 80s pop videos um, when I went on the walk with Nick we went down this alleyway here again you know I probably should say oh don't do things that are dangerous or you know whatever it's very slippery down there but it gave some beautiful views and this is actually quite a beautiful building it looks a bit neglected now I don't know what goes on in there but it's a lovely place this is also this street down here I mean we could see it from the back we'll, walk, we'll carry on down Crickywood Lane I should give a shout out at this point as well to the wonderful West End Lane Books, which is not far from here. And I did a talk there about the book, and I mentioned um, I mentioned this area, and it was full of local knowledge, and we had a really good debate about Crickwood. Anna Valentine has asked, "Is there anywhere in London you wouldn't want to walk?" No. If there was a place in London I thought I wouldn't want to walk there, if I had that impulse, I think, "Oh, I don't, I don't really want to walk there." that would be the reason I would walk there. Is there anywhere I wouldn't write about walking to? There probably are because there's some, you know, sort of central London I think is pretty well covered. Like I think, I can't imagine writing about Soho or Bloomsbury for example. As much as I love walking around both those areas of London, I think there's so many books about those parts of London. But um, I had that feeling when I walked to the Dartford Salt Marshes over um, through Abbey Woods and actually when I looked at it on the map, I thought it looked so remote. I thought I'm going to be on my own for about six or seven hours in the woods, just with the sound of the voices in my head, as Maureen mentioned earlier on. And I just thought, ah, I'm not sure I've got it in me. Um, but that spurred me on. That made it more of an experience. That made it feel like the experience I had when I went into the jungle in Borneo, bizarrely, and that was a genuine response. Um, how do you feel about the stereotype we have of a Londoner? Ah, cynical, disconnected and rude. Is this something that your life in London has corroborated? That's a really good question, James. Um, I don't think I... Naturally, I don't subscribe to that stereotype. It's a stereotype that's foisted upon Londoners. I'm going to make enemies now. By, by provincials. I think they're people who don't get London. I think you know, London is a fast-paced, dirty city in a lot of ways compared to say Bath <laughs> for example but that's what it is and I think you can't expect it to be like your tidy provincial town or your nice city in a in you know it, it's not going to be like Auckland or something you know it is what it is it is one of the great global cities of the world so once you accept it as that the behavior of people so the outward behavior of people um, makes a lot more sense but I don't think Londoners are actually any more cynical than people anywhere else are I think I think they um I think it's it's a coping mechanism for the environment but you know people in London are very respectful of each other in a way that they probably aren't in other places which is another way of looking at it uh, Tessa or 
If you're going to watch someone else do a story, well, which city would you like to watch? That's a fascinating question. Tessa, I'm going to give you a slightly uh, ridiculous answer, actually, to this. On the way here, I was thinking, I would love to, <laughs> I would love to watch a story walk around the ancient city of Susa, which is now just rubble in the desert. <laughs> Sorry if that, uh, but that that's what's on my mind. That's what I was thinking about today. I thought, I wonder if you could do a story walk through the ancient city of Susa. And I would love that story walk to be led by the author Graham Hancock, who uh, writes a lot about ancient civilizations and has got some interesting ideas about that. He's also well into hallucinogenics, which is something I'm less keen on. Um, but yes, ancient cities, historical story walk. How about that? Through places that don't exist anymore. A lot of the things I'm talking about don't exist anymore either. Actually, and who would you want to do the story walk? Okay, that was the same question, wasn't it? Yeah, Graham Hancock walking around Susa. What's interesting, whether this relates to London, is that the I don't I only read about it um, the other day, this city of Susa, but it was an amazing city that um, that was eventually sacked by um, well, it was conquered by Alexander the Great, and I think not long afterwards uh, was burnt to the ground. Um, but it existed for about two thousand years and was an incredible kind of regional hub and a big thriving centre. Like I say, there's nothing left of it now. And um, although London has been settled for a number of years, thousands of years, thousands and thousands of years, we don't know exactly how long really, some of the settlements go back. Horsenden Hill has been settled for over 7,000 years. But in terms of the, the built city of London, you might be looking at say 2,000, 2,500 years. There was a city built before the Romans came, but it wasn't that big. So really, you know, we can't imagine there not being a London anymore, can we? But there were people living in Susa who probably couldn't imagine there not being a Susa anymore. Talking of the ancient origins of London, as we come up to Cricklewood Broadway here, Cricklewood Broadway is part of the old Roman uh, Watling Street. This road here, this is Cricklewood Broadway. And a uh, really busy, noisy, northern arterial road um, but it's part of an old Roman road, uh, the Roman Watling Street, which um, linked, um, where did it go, where did Watling Street go? It went, uh, it certainly went, I think it went out to Colchester, uh, sorry, no, it went to St Albans, I've just seen in my notes. <laughs> it went between Canterbury and St Albans. Um, but, actually, it's believed that Watling Street was built along an even older ancient British trackway. So this idea that we're told that there weren't really many people living, there wasn't really much of a civilization in this part of the world, the Romans brought civilization. Well, if that was the case, why were there so many roads that uh, crisscrossed this area? The walk I did from Sudbury Hill to Hanwell went along another Neolithic trackway. So there was clearly significant settlements in this region. There was clearly some uh, quite a, an advanced civilization that had an a road network that even the great road builders, the Romans, couldn't really, all they did was just pave it. They didn't make new roads, they just improved the existing roads. They were almost actually doing a bit of conservation work. So this is Cricklewood Broadway. Now, this is <laughs> the slightly obscure reference here, and one of my favourite ones is that the Cricklewood is uh, where um, the goodies was set and filmed. And uh, I think I've gone the wrong way on Cricklewood Broadway. This, this is what can happen. Where am I going? Have I gone the wrong way at Cricklewood Broadway? This is this is my life. This is what happens when I go out walking. This is the exact experience of going out walking. Came out Cricklewood. No, I didn't. What threw me is the what threw me is that bingo place. I don't remember that. Was that there? That's because I was walking with Nick Papadimitri and he probably you think I talk, bloody hell. I tell you what, he doesn't stop. He kept saying things all day that I couldn't put in the book. You go, I oh, don't put that in the book. I was going, well, I've got to put something in the book. I'll end up having to make it up. Luckily, I didn't have to. So this is where the goodies were shot all around here. And what this highlights for me, in a way, is that you notice how many London sitcoms and how much comedy relies on London suburbs for its jokes. I sort of In the book, I call them punchline suburbs. And uh, Cricklewood was one. So the, the goodies, if you go and look at it or something on YouTube, it's amazing. And all sorts of weird stuff would happen in the goodies. There was a, my favourite one is this enormous kitten. Uh, they they have this kitten and they give it a growth drug and it it, it becomes this enormous kitten. And it's called Kitten Kong and it starts destroying all the buildings. Uh, and there's another one where the last dodo. They find a dodo and it's the last dodo and they have to protect it. And it goes one. It goes gets lost in the streets. 
the title sequence of the goodies has them riding around these streets on a ta on a on a no, it's not a tandem, is it? Because there's lots of people on the bike. I don't know what you call it when you can get lots of people on a bike, three people. But uh, so I sort of feel that they used the supposed banality of places like Cricketwood to counterbalance the surrealism of the comedy. Um, nearby here on the same walk we went through Neesden and Neesden was the butt of jokes for a long time to the extent that the people of Neesden launched a campaign called Stop Knocking Neesden and uh, this is in the 1970s and uh, they put up posters around everywhere uh, saying Stop Knocking Neesden you know because they, they didn't take the joke they got upset by the fact they were being made fun of and I think we do take the fun of suburban people or the sort of, it's sort of like sophisticated people that live in Bloomsbury and Hampstead like to take a pop at people that live in places like Cricklewood and Neesden it's a form of snobbery really um, you could also say that a lot of the comedians grew up in places like this and so really they're referencing their own childhoods that they escaped from which would be slightly more understandable. Um, it came up again recently, though, the Stop Knocking Knees and Thing. Um, the show Mr. Selfridge, which I believe is on ITV, stars Jeremy Piven, who was in Entourage. That was shot around Knees, and, and he was on Graham Norton saying how much he liked, uh, saying that it was filmed in Knees, and Graham Norton said that it sounded like a cruel and unusual punishment. And Piven apparently went, oh, no, no, I really like it. I'm thinking of buying a house there. And the next day in the Evening Standard, the headline was Norton Knox Neesdom. So, yeah, that came back 40 years later. Now, I believe, um, although some people might correct me on this, actually, this Matterland sits on the site of one of London's great film studios, Stoll Studios. Um, was, it came in 1919. Oswald Stoll was a theatre impresario, and he, Stoll Moss is still a theatre group that owns a lot of theatres in London. And uh, this is where he came to build his film studios. At that time in uh, London, the early sort of film pioneers withdrew to the outer suburbs of London, whereas in America they went into the desert and they built Hollywood in the desert. In London, they, they came to the sort of like the outer suburbs and they built their studios in the industrial fringe amongst the aircraft factories and crisps. Smith's crisps was invented here around this time as well. Um, so chip factories, crisp factories, aircraft factories, film studios all existed in the same sort of areas around the edges of London. There was a film studio at Walthamstow, Gainsborough Studios where Alfred Hitchcock worked, which was on, on the border of Hackney and Islington. And here, great studio, Cricklewood Studios, stole pictures. One of the films was called The, the Glorious Adventure, which is a sprawling epic set during the Great Fire of London, for, uh, featured the Duke of Rutland's daughter, supposedly the most beautiful woman in England according to the Duke of Rutland. And um, there was, they also made Dick Turpin, The Secret Kingdom, Old Mother Riley. And uh, the studio shut about 1938, I think. And uh, there's no trace of it now. To the extent that there was a satirical TV show, it was like a mockumentary called The Cricklewood Greats, presented by Peter Capaldi. Now, what's Peter Capaldi's next job? Doctor Who. My God, we've gone back to Doctor Who. That's accidental. Um, and it was called The Cricketwood Greats. I thought, obviously, this is about the studio. And it wasn't, actually. I don't believe. There's no, I've found no reference that the mockumentary related to the real film production that went on in Cricketwood. Actually, the reason they chose Cricketwood was it was the last place you'd imagine there would be a film studio. And that actually, that was a bit of a joke. You know, a documentary called The Cricketwood Greats. What a laugh. Whereas, obviously, they make documentaries about Ealing Studios and all the rest of it. The Greats of Ealing, no one laughs. The Greats of Cricklewood, ha ha, what a giggle. Uh, again, Cricklewood works as a punchline suburb, but actually you could have made a documentary called The Cricklewood Greats. It wouldn't have been a mockumentary, it would have been a documentary, the same as those documentaries about Shepperton, Shepperton and Ealing, and it would have been about this. Now it's a shame that Oswald Stoll, who brought Hollywood directors over here, didn't have the chutzpah to uh, put Crickle wood on the hills, like Hollywood, Dudden Hill up here, Dollis Hill. Imagine if you put big white signs, Crickle wood, because that was done to sell property, the Hollywood sign. That was just real estate advert. Shame Oswald Stoll didn't do the same thing, and then they wouldn't uh, mock Crickle wood quite as much. Well, I think that is the uh, that is the end of this particular story walk. Uh, I don't know how long I've been talking. Oh God. Half an hour, 40 minutes. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I've got a couple more questions here. Tandem is generic reference to Eric Wimbach. You Googled that, Eric. Uh, tandem is a generic reference to any bike for more than one person. Thank you, Eric. That's, well, thanks for clearing that up. 
I'm sure there'll be people that'll be very grateful to know that now. And James Lewis is said another pop culture question: Which films got get London right? Only one that comes to mind for me is about a boy. There is a film, James, um, which is not quite that pop cultural, but it's uh, a film called London by Patrick Keeler, and it's a documentary. But it's kind of mm, it's part documentary, part fiction. Un it's an unseen narrator it takes you on journeys around London. That really nails London for me. Um, more pop culture-y would be um, is a film called The Sandwich Man, 1966, written by Michael Benteen. I think it might have been directed by Michael Benteen, who was one of the original Goon Show. Fantastic film. This guy who has a sandwich board walks across London from the Docklands to um, walks across from Docklands to the West End, and that's a beautiful vision of London. Uh, other films: The London Nobody Knows, which is a documentary version of um, a book by Geoffrey Fletcher, it's narrated by and presented by um, James Mason. Uh, there probably is loads of other London films, aren't there? Really? I mean, London is a difficult. I always felt naked, the Mike Lee film got London right. I think Mike Lee has a pretty good sense of London. Naked is a good film about London. There's another film called uh, he made called Another Year, which is set in uh, Wanstead and filmed all around Wanstead, and that really is an interesting vision of London. As is his film Mean Time, that's one of my favourite London films, Mean Time. It's got a very young Tim Roth and a young Gary Oldman, and that's Mike Lee. That's, very well, that's well worth looking up. Uh, any others? I think when they do glitzy commercial films, I think they don't because they're just heading. They're, they're they're aiming for sort of like American audiences and international audiences. So what they create is a very bland kind of uh, vision of London. Although the Fantastic Four has one of the best shots of London I've ever seen. When uh, I don't know who it is the baddie in that film drains the Thames, and they using CGI, they beautifully kind of create a Thames completely drained of water. Uh, have a look. It's actually I put some screen grabs of that on my blog. Um, and that's an amazing vision of London. Uh, American Werewolf in London. That's an interesting. God, there are so many. There's so many, so many. There's another, another London film which is I recommend watching is Bronco Bullfrog, and that's set around Stratford in the 1960s. And that's a very different Stratford to the Stratford you see. Uh, it, presented by the Olympics. Um, watch that. It's really good. That's out on BFI DVD. Right, okay, I think that's it for me today. Remember to buy the book, <laughs> This Other London Adventures in the Overlook City, published by HarperCollins. Thank you for listening, and uh, yeah, yeah, see you soon. Out in the streets, wandering over Horsenden Hill, looking for a ghostly horse. 